This is a very old debate between freedom and intervention. Facebook knows things that nobody else knows. The younger generation is becoming aware of that problem and is becoming tired of being controlled by certain social media platforms. In 2016, Cambridge Analytica had harvested data of 87 million Facebook users and used it for political advertising purposes. Suddenly, a lot of people were thinking of deleting their Facebook accounts. Do you want to share your private data to a big online platform you don't know? Cambridge Analytica was shut down on the 1st of May 2018. However, the problem of giving away data wasn't solved. Still, 1.62 billion people on average log onto Facebook daily. They accept cookies in order to download or use pages on the internet without reading the long list of endless terms of cookies. Many people are not aware of the fact they are giving away data all the time. Did you know that in the 21st century, data is the most valuable research in the world? We want to know what this influence can have on you as an individual, but also on the whole world around you. Against all expectations, Donald Trump became President of the United States of America in 2016. Do you associate this victory with Facebook propaganda or do you think you haven't been influenced by this at all? Next year there are new elections. What will happen then? Are people nowadays influenced to the extent that this will influence the democracy in a very negative way? Society is getting more and more digitized. The chance that we are getting influenced by any social media platform is only growing. There are already 2.3 billion Facebook users, and this number will probably only grow. Do you have a Facebook account? Yes. 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 I do. I do. Yes. I do. Yes. 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 Yes
it was the process of repurposing a technique that was used for academic research for commercial purposes and ultimately political purposes was where they had run afoul of Facebook policy and British law. And so that's the main reason why it caused a scandal. I mean, I think um, there are many companies that do voter profiling and targeting um, for both parties. So it's very commonplace. Um, what's particular about Cambridge Analytica is how they collected data maliciously and then used it for malicious purposes. So especially when you read Chris Wiley's book and you see how the data was used to promote r racism and xenophobia, used to demobilize voters, to, to, to depress and discourage voters from participating. No one expected the data to be collected and used in this manner. Um, and it re represented an abuse of the mechanism. What is the data being used for? Is it being used for democracy or is it being used against it? And that's the key question. Yeah. In order to use Facebook, you will need your own Facebook account. Thereby, you must give them a list of standard information, such as your name, profile picture, gender, age, ad network, like school or work. You must also give them access to all the information about your actions with ads and sponsored content. However, it remains unclear how big the amount of data is that Facebook collects, because most of the time you do not realize you are sharing your data. A professor from the University of Groningen will tell us more. My name is Marc Esteve del Valle. Well, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies and Journalism here at the University of Groningen. And I do research uh, on the interplay between new media and politics. Specifically, I do analysis on online political polarization and cyber parties. Before, uh, during the television and the radio time, right, that we call this media environment, this is what we call the mass media environment, no? It was not possible to target in the way that we are targeting today. Today, it's time that you go to, uh, on Facebook, uh, that you go on TikTok, uh, mm -hmm. whatever social media, you are, you are basically leaving some traces, some footprints. Politicians, uh, via buying um, these footprints, uh, they can know much more from you than what they could know from you, uh, or from your parents, uh, let's say, in the past. In the, in the 20th century. Yeah. So all these data that we have access to today, that we didn't have access to in the past, can be used to better target uh, specific sectors of the population. Facebook doesn't just look at your Facebook profile, your public posts and the pictures you share. For them, it's very useful to know how long you have looked at specific pages so that they know how their advertisements make sense to you. Facebook can harvest data about you when you aren't even logged in as a user. They collect data from your devices like your phone, laptop and tablet. They also collect data via advisors, app developers and publishers. If you want to download an app, there is a big chance that the app will harvest some data from you and sell it to Facebook. Facebook will also get data via the cookies you accept. Most people do not bother to read the terms first or to disable the data harvesting in your cookie settings, which is quite understandable. If Facebook collects your data, they use the data to provide personalized and improve their products, as they say. They use the information about their users to deliver features and products. They also use the information to create personalized products for every user and so that they only show advertisements you may be interested in. Facebook provides third-party partners of theirs with information so that you can use Facebook for free. Facebook does not sell any information, but they do sell access to information. The European model that's best represented by the GDPR is built on the consent model where you have to, to be informed of how your data might be used and you have to choose to opt into it. This is different than, for example, the American model which you have to opt out of your data being collected and used. The problem though with the consent model is, can we even understand enough to give consent? Um, do the companies provide us with enough information so that we can make that choice in a reasonable, educated way? Probably not. We need a lot more work in regards of um, the right of explanation. There are some ways to help protect your data for yourself. 
For starters, you can go to apps and websites in your Facebook settings and turn off your ability to interact with apps, websites and games on Facebook and off Facebook. This stops third parties like websites and games on your phone to collect your data. This may also prevent you from using certain platform-based apps or websites like Farmville because they will not let you use the website or app without you giving up your data. Another thing you can do to protect your data is make all your posts, and messages, etc. private. If you go to your Facebook settings, there are many options to privatize your account. Most of the times you can choose who can see your information. Only you, friends, friends of friends, everyone, or a list of people you customized yourself. If you make all of this private, then only your public profile will still be available for companies or other people who want to use your data. To understand how much data you were sharing with Facebook, it might be a good idea to download all your personal data. You can download this if you go to your Facebook settings, then go to your Facebook information. You can choose to download all your personal data there. Well, now we know how our data and what kind of data is collected by big data companies. But why does everyone keep clicking and signing up on Facebook? And why do we keep sharing data to online platforms when we know it could be used against us? With its content, Cambridge Analytica tried to influence people in a political opinion via Facebook. But in what way did they want us to be influenced? What was their goal? So my name is Misha Koster. I'm a media psychologist. So I specialize in what the effects of media are on human behavior and how you can use media to influence human behavior. I make a difference between, on one hand, influencing behavior and on the other hand, changing behavior. So influencing behavior is defined as um, influencing behavior at one point in time, getting people to do something. Changing behavior is getting people to do something for a longer period of time. And those are two kinds of ways to like create a campaign. We know that there is a lot of power in repeating a message. In order to really change behavior, it takes more than just repeating a message more often. Uh, it really takes specialized uh, campaigns with reward systems. And um, what they actually did is they created a lot of profiles of people. Based on these profiles, they created lots and lots and lots of content that taps in to exactly what I find important. So they, they did a really good like segmentation, almost on a one-to-one -one level, to give me a message that they thought I would like to see. And the messages themselves, they, they sometimes were even fake news. Some of the things are not actually fake. In the, in the sense of that they're like thought up, but they were framed differently. So people keep checking Facebook only when this behavior can provide continuous rewards. Different message characteristics influence how long you're willing to spend your time on Facebook. There are two main subjects in message characteristics, message richness and message synchronicity. Message richness is the ability of a message to enable people to reproduce its contents. People find it harder to process textual information than photos or videos. They find spending time to understand messages boring. And this will reduce the satisfaction of using a social media platform. Message synchronicity is the extent to which users can see and give feedback to messages at the same time the message is posted. It's easier to understand messages synchronous, so with little time between feedback and posting, than asynchronous. We are not quite sure how big the effect of Cambridge Analytica has been for the American society. It's almost impossible to know how many advertisements you need to see before you will be influenced. The Cambridge Analytica campaigning was meant to get people's minds shifted, right, in a certain direction. Mm. But the result of that mind shift was not visible on things they were doing in Facebook. So we don't really understand if political influence occurs in the way people expect. Most political science research on this issue is looking at whether votes get changed. And that's a very difficult question to answer and probably is impossible to answer. Um, we were probably asking the wrong question. I think if we were asking the questions how voters are mobilized and demobilized by these influence campaigns, we would have a better understanding of their effects. We know that Facebook has had effects on elections. So for example, Facebook did their own experiment on turnout 
And what they did is they added a feature to their interface where your friends avatars would appear on this um, thing in the newsfeed when they um, checked into a voting. So if like a friend said they voted, then it would show in your feed, these are the friends who have voted. And Facebook studied this and they found that when they showed whether your friends voted, it increased turnout in those districts by huge margins. And so Facebook was able to mobilize voters by just a tiny um, modification to their interface. So Facebook has already demonstrated it can change turnout in elections based on its interface. So we already know it's possible to influence elections with Facebook. There are just many different ways to do it. And only some of the ways are measurable. And Facebook knows better than anyone the impacts. And probably Facebook knows things that nobody else knows. So there's such an asymmetry of knowledge and information and understanding. It's really hard to say. And ultimately, only Mark Zuckerberg knows the most about what's possible. We asked people on the streets if they thought they were being influenced by Facebook. Do you use Facebook often? How often do you use it? Nothing. Once or twice a day or something. Yeah, I don't know what's often. Uh, How many times per day? I think I open it like two times a day. So we saw wel elke dag. Nee, ik denk wel tien keer per dag. Heb je ever encountered fake news? Ja, cool. And do you always uh, know that it was fake or did you realize later on that it was When fake? you read proper you can see it's fake. And when you think it's your own perfect brain, yeah. you can see it's fake. Kijk je nog wat te controleren. Ik weet checken dat er wat van andere zijden zijn. What information do you think Facebook has about you? Well not that much. I think work what to do for work and what university I go to. <laughs> but I think they, they know more about me than I know. What information do you think Facebook has about you? preferences of me, um, what I like or um, what I do, my personal life, when, when, when is my birthday, all these kinds of things. You're being influenced by social media nowadays. Yes, I do. And again, is it also you can do a lot of Um I think I've been been influenced a little bit, but, um, but at the same time, I think my uh, personal preferences are more important to me. Um, I think that um, my mother, for example, can influence me far uh, more than uh, someone uh, on the internet. Denkt u dat u beïnvloed wordt door Facebook? Ik denk dat u wel. Well, I think they do influence me. I don't know that they influence me, but they they must have some influence. But uh, I think not that much. And do you think people are getting influenced by social media accounts? Of course they are. Yes, of course. Yes. And do you think that's a danger from the it time we're living in? You know, people have said. It's, it depends. It depends on the, if you know if you know if if you're normal, you're not going to be influenced by it. weird stuff. Do you think you are being influenced by any ads or posts on Facebook? No. I see them with the more scroll on I skip them. Denkt u dat u beïnvloed wordt door social media? Ja, ik niet hoor, maar misschien uh, andere mensen wel, denk ik. What do you think uh, dangers of social media are? Dangers? Yeah, dangers. There aren't any. There are no dangers from social media. No, not really. Not for, for smart people, there are none. Heeft u wel eens gedacht aan de gevaren van uh, bijvoorbeeld het verzamelen van gegevens op Facebook? Ja. Nee. Ja, nee, ik ben er niet zo mee bezig. We are wondering how many people actually see political posts on Facebook. So we went on the streets of Leiden to ask people this question. Heeft u ooit een politieke post of advertentie gezien op Facebook? Ja. Denkt u dat u daardoor beïnvloed wordt in uw politieke keuzes? Nou ja, ik heb die politieke partijen ben ik gaan volgen, dus ja, denk ik wel. Have you ever seen a political post or ad on Facebook? Ja. And do you think you were influenced by it? Uh, in some ways, yes. Um, I mean, I follow the political party that I vote for on Facebook, so I mean, I see those. Yeah, maybe if it wasn't on, on Facebook, I wouldn't have known about certain standpoints and certain views of certain political parties, so I 
do think I was going to put this up. Have you ever seen a political post or ad on Facebook? Yeah. Have you ever seen a political post or advertising? Yes. It's interesting to see that people think they aren't influenced at all, but later on tell us that they uh, voted for the party they saw on Facebook. So in fact, they are influenced, but it seems they don't want to admit. So is there something in our brain that keeps us from believing uh, we are influenced by social media platforms? So first of all, we are much more inclined to believe stuff that is written down. So if somebody tells us something, it's a story. If we read something, it's a fact. We believe a lot of stuff. That's also because we don't have the cognitive capacity to question everything that's happening around us. You know, if we were to question every piece of communication that we uh, encounter during a day, then you know, 24 hours would not be enough. So that's why we have like two systems that help us cope with that. So the slow system is the system that we think we're using all day long. Uh, this is the system, this is our rational brain, this is the system of free will. So then there's the second system, it's the fast system. It's kind of based on these quick decisions, unconscious, very unconscious. And we take about 95% of our decisions all day long based on this fast system. Uh, problem is that we don't want to hear that because it means that in about 95% of the times we're acting as, as robots uh, and can be easily influenced by people who know how this fast system works. For instance, uh, psychologists. We kind of think that we will not be influenced because we're so rational and uh, we have our own free will. Uh, but actually that's only the case in about 5% of the time. So we only have a free will 5% of the time. Does this mean we use this 5% to make rational decisions in politics while a lot of companies are trying to influence us to vote differently? We ask another expert if she thinks we can still make our own choices. I'm Laura Biga, I'm professor of American Studies here at the University of Groningen. My expertise is in yeah, American literature very broadly, but also in American uh, political culture and cultural theory. These are also within my realm of expertise. I think that people are still capable of acting politically. What I hope is that there is an increasing awareness. And I mean, your documentary kind of points me in that direction that the, you know, the younger generation is becoming aware of that problem and is becoming tired of being controlled by certain, you know, social media platforms. And I think in the end, there's still, you know, control in the hands of the users. I think there's something that, um, that users can do. We wonder if a lot of people are being influenced in their political opinion because of posts on Facebook. In the 2016 elections, Trump's campaign led to his victory. Cambridge Analytica played a big role in voter mobilization and targeted Clinton supporters, but also persuadable voters. Trump won at this point with great distance from Clinton. But is the technique that Cambridge Analytica used still possible? If Facebook voluntarily closed down what was called the Graph API. There was a certain date when they shut it down and then they grandfathered certain co companies that could still use it for a period of time. But, but at this time, it's not possible okay. to use that technique anymore. It's not to say that data harvesting isn't happening by other means. Mm -hmm. It probably is. So David tells us that after the so-called Graph API was closed down, the specific technique that was used by Cambridge Analytica wasn't possible to use anymore. But this doesn't mean that data harvesting is not happening by other means. We need to come up with more solutions in order to gain more confidence in the protection of our data. My name is Dario Fazzi and I am a lecturer in US history at uh, the University of Leiden. I'm also a lecturer in uh, US history and politics at the University of Nijmegen and at the moment I'm also teaching at the University, at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Many candidates in the United States but all over the world rely on uh, uh, big data, big data companies. But of course one thing is to reach out to the whole public one other thing is to reach out to the public who you think may vote for you. These messages, in the end, they are just words. And they, of course, are meant to 
uh, shape the minds to convince people to have an electoral opinion. But that process is not only created by the messages, it's created by your brain. <laughs> So if your brain is not trained enough, educated enough to distinguish whether or not that message is a good one or a dangerous one, uh, then the solution won't be in locking up social media. It can become a threat when this instrument, this tool that we have at our disposal is not used correctly or is used, of course, uh, not for the right purposes. And Cambridge Analytica is the perfect story. In the American elections, profiling is crucial. The more candidates know about their electors, the better they can uh, structure their campaign. The electoral system in the United States is established on this rule that is called winner takes all. Trump won also because of the electoral system. Trump got less votes in absolute terms. Every state in the United States has a different weight on the electoral college. So it's very important to know who your voters are. It should be on the government to regulate the issue and to make sure that uh, sensitive data are not really tradable unless people want to. In the US is very different because we don't have a general horizontal privacy law like the EU has, we have these very narrow vertical laws that apply to very narrow situations and contexts. So for example, there's a privacy law for schools, but privacy is not protected outside of those narrow contexts. This has created the problems that we have where we really don't have effective privacy protections because they're so narrow to very specific situations as opposed to the European model which is general and just applies across the whole society. And so ultimately the United States has recognized that it needs a general horizontal level of protection. Um, there's talk of a national privacy law which was not being discussed before Cambridge Analytica. So the scandal changed the conversation in the United States and illustrated why we need at least some kind of a European model. The general rule is that pri uh, privacy, that data protection in, in Europe is much stricter than in the US. I think there is so much fear of government regulation. Um, the Mark Zuckerberg's um, you know, plea for uh, First Amendment, protection of First Amendment, right? He, he, his plea for Facebook is freedom of speech. He, um, he exploits the fear of government power and of, of regulation from which he profits very well. You can see a, a, a tradition, you can draw a direct line from uh, Zuckerberg making these arguments to um, counterculture leaders, hippies making these arguments in the 60s. But it's, it's always, it plays on a fear against regulation that is very deep-seated uh, in American culture. The use of data should be limited up to a point that this use doesn't prevent, let's say, ourselves to have our privacy. This is a very old debate between, you know, freedom and intervention. We should rethink what power we are giving to these companies. Facebook now, as I was saying, uh, has almost, yeah, doesn't have the, the monopole, but uh, the ownership of big four social media, right? And this is giving to this company a lot of power over the market of social media. So now the question could be, should we force Facebook to split and to sell one of these companies to other companies or not? Because, you know, the power is so strong that this might be dangerous, right? There are other factors, yes. But uh, Donald Trump's use of uh, new media, and specifically Facebook, uh, was a clear factor of reaching the presidency. Political advertisements on Facebook could influence people in a way that it can change their political opinions. It may even have the power to determine political elections. People are kind of going a little bit more towards extremes. Because, for instance, the economic crisis, you need to find solutions. And then these political parties, uh, the extreme political parties, they come with extreme solutions. Now, if you go and uh, you decide to move towards these extremes, and you start 
listening only via the use of social media. I need to say yes, in this case, it might be that social media um, are facilitating what we call these echo chambers that you are only listening to those people that they think like you. There are first some other causes that, that are pushing you towards this political extreme. Now at the same time, uh, we have uh, empirical studies that they show that people that go the more on the internet, the people that participate the more uh, on social media, are those that they use these communication channels to interact with people that they think different than them. So we cannot blame the medium, we cannot blame the communication channel. At the end is what we do about this medium, right? About this communication channel. A few days before the US elections of 2016, the Huffington Post's data team had Clinton's election probability at 98.3%. So the result was a surprise to a lot of people. Because the outcome of the elections was different than lots of people had thought, we wonder if experts think that the US can still be called democratic. Democracy needs to be protected. Democracy is not a stone that we have in there and it will never change and it will protect us forever. Democracy is more like a plant that gives you all you need through its shadows, makes you feel good. But what do you need to do in order to have the plant there? You need to nourish it, to put water on it, to take care of it. Otherwise the plant will die. And how do you do that? In many ways, you participate, you are an active citizen, but most importantly, this I think is the real core of a democracy, you need to understand what is your role. You need to really understand that democracy doesn't work without you. Democracy depends on citizens, on aware citizens. You need to understand that you are not just a human being who incidentally happens to have the right to vote. Democracy is all about active citizenship. You need to take care of this role, to know what it means. And in order to know, you need to be educated. Again, okay? democracy cannot work without education. In that case, the United States is, it, is at risk, as well as many other democracies in the world. We stopped nourishing them. We stopped giving water to democracy. And we need to do that. Otherwise, social media will do. And that's not good water. But don't you think it's a bit scary? What if the whole democracy would eventually fade away? Do I think uh, the US can be called a democratic country. Yes, it is a democracy. Right? This is all about the functioning of a democracy. It's not about the core mm, of the democracy. I don't think the, the core of American democracy is, is under threat or is in danger. Can you still call uh, the US, a country, yeah. yeah, the US for example, a democratic country if so many people were maybe influenced by these kind of, yeah, Companies. companies, data companies. It, we, we don't know the effects of the influence, so it's, yeah. we can't say that. What I think it's more closer to what Carol Cadwallader says in her TED talk that we don't know if we have free and fair elections because the laws are not equipped to handle the situation of the tech companies. It's a, a more complicated question, but I think we would have more confidence in elections if we had more regulation of our data and these companies. Do you think something will change in the future? I mean, what will happen in the upcoming elections? Might come with a radical idea, but I think that what we need is a public Facebook. By public, I, I, I don't mean that the state creates public company, but I mean an organization, an association that might be run by citizens having different interests than the ones that Facebook has of mainly doing profits. Yeah, we need to be very creative. Um, if not, I'm afraid that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that this is just the beginning. 
I think users should be educated also to, to, to privacy. Without a, a conscious and aware use of these tools, even the best tools for democracy can backfire, can become boomerang. It's all about that. You need to know how to use them. Privacy rules are uh, some of the most important defenses that we have against the abuse of our own information. Do you share information? about yourself. So you should be aware of that. Uh, regulation is one thing. It is important to have privacy rules and enforcing them. Make sure that people cannot mistreat hmm, our da data. I guess the problem is when you are not aware that somebody is using your data in order to profile you. That's really a shame. And that's where the government should intervene. The biggest problem with some of the social media uh, companies that we have right now is simply that they are too big. I think Facebook needs to be broken up and the problem, the, the monopoly you know, power that they have would not be so disconcerting anymore if Facebook would be broken up. Uh, everything is, is super new. Uh, this is why we call new media. And uh, there's a lot of room for imagination and creativity, but also there's a lot of room for damage. Now, uh, it seems that we are, we are living the dark side of, of social media. We need to study this, but I'm convinced that, uh, of course, we need to intervene. One way or another, we, we, need to, we need to step in as a society. Yeah. I think to find a solution to this uh, conundrum, to this problem, is media literacy. You might practice sports. You might uh, eat some specific food. So you have a sport diet, you have a food diet, right? But what about your media diet? Did you ever think about the effects that the consumption of a certain specific type of media have on the way you imagine this world? So media literacy, explaining this, explaining what I'm explaining now to you, uh, the effects, the consequences of consuming a specific type of media on your personality, on the way you think, is exactly this. We need to do a lot of work on educating uh, in this regard. I think I will look primarily at the platforms and the way the platforms are designed. A lot of the stuff that, that for instance, Cambridge Analytica did is also based upon this social proof principle. So if a lot of people are, are like communicating something or sharing something or liking or commenting on something, then we are inclined to think that it's probably uh, something truthful or, or valuable. So if you look at Instagram now, um, in which uh, they're rolling out a worldwide uh, development of hiding all the like uh, numbers, I think that's a good development because then people will not be able to respond very much to popularity of a piece of content, but they will actually like be, be triggered to look at the content itself. I think it would help a lot if there is a boundary on the number of times that one person can see a certain uh, advertisement. Because when you look at research about fake news, for instance, we see that a piece of fake news that is uh, seen for multiple times and is even listed or, or labeled as being disputed, afterwards will be seen as more trustworthy than a real piece of news uh, that has been seen for one time. Uh, this, this is in psychology called the illusory truth effect and it has to do with the, the more times we see something, it, it's easier for us to process it and recognize it. And our brain somehow interprets it as, okay, then it's probably more true, which is disturbing uh, because that way you can get a piece of fake news if you just communicate it enough and enough and enough, people will actually start believing it. So in the US, no new laws have been passed. So there's no new protections for democracy here. There's been many things proposed, but nothing has been passed. Everything has been blocked. Nothing is really different in 2020. The only thing that's different is the general awareness among the public and that Facebook and Twitter and Google have increased some transparency about political advertising and modified some of their policies around political advertising. Interestingly, we do know that strong data protection laws in the EU have prevented Cambridge Analytica from operating in elections, even though it has wanted to. In particular, 
Cambridge Analytica wanted to work in the French, German, and elections in the Netherlands. They wanted to work for far-right parties. They were not able to because the data protection laws and enforcement was so strong in those three countries that it really scared Cambridge Analytica away. And so these are illustrations that strong data protection laws and regulators can scare the bad guys away. France, Germany, and the Netherlands have been protected from these kinds of invaders. That's a big reason why I advocate for stronger data protection rights enforcement in the United States. In the books written by Chris Wiley and Brittany Kaiser, they talk about how the company looked for countries with weak privacy laws to exploit. Good laws, well enforced, have deterrent effects. And that's the most we can hope for. In the United States, it's still possible that companies use your data for targeting purposes. It's quite easy to get this data. They can use it for making advertisements or messages on Facebook to influence you. It's unclear what the effects of targeting are, because it's almost impossible to measure if it influences you to change your opinion or vote. There are many ways to protect your data yourself. For one thing, you can alter your Facebook settings so that certain information will be private, such as messages and your friend list. Another thing you can do is disconnect your Facebook account with all apps and websites so that no apps or websites will get data from you. However, this does not enable cookies. According to experts, there are several solutions to protect democracy from big data companies. There could be more strict privacy laws. Then it could also be an option to change the way Facebook is designed. For example, via hiding likes or treating Facebook like a media company. Another solution is educating people of what Facebook is doing with our data so that they are more aware of it and they can distinguish the difference between fake and true news. Finally, splitting Facebook up could solve the problem. Facebook will then gain less power and there will be more competition for the social media platform. Nowadays, data is the most valuable resource in the world. And companies like Facebook are using the lack of protection of your data for their own profit. They use the world's unawareness to their advantage.